Hey there drone fans, Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'd like to take a few minutes and try to answer a few questions about the brand new Spark that have come into the channel. I've gotten a lot of questions through email and on the YouTube channel about certain functions or features about this particular quad. Now, I've been out flying this thing like crazy over the last five or six days, and I've discovered a lot of little things about it that you might find interesting. So what I thought I'd do is maybe every week I'll sit down, pick the top five questions that I get the most often that week, try to put a clip together and explain the answers to those questions and how I arrived at those conclusions. So this week I've got five of the most popular questions that have come in. I'm going to go through them one at a time and explain sort of the engineering behind the answers to the questions. Some of them are easy, some are a little more complicated, but I feel like by doing this every week I'll be able to keep you guys fully informed on how the Spark operates out there and make it a more enjoyable flying experience for everybody. So stay tuned and we'll get into it. This first question is by far the most popular question I've seen on my channel. I've noticed that on a lot of the forums that I frequent as well, and it has to do with using the Mavic controller to actually fly the Spark. A lot of people that own the Mavic are thinking, gee, this is a great little quad to have as maybe a second quad to use in certain circumstances. It'd be really cool if I could just buy the less expensive package and use my Mavic controller to fly this thing. The short answer is you can't, and there's a couple of reasons for that, and I thought it explained some of the engineering behind it so it makes more sense to you. Now, it's no right now, but it may be yes down the road, and I'll explain that too. So for starters, both of these controllers use the ISM band, which is the Wi-Fi band. So the Mavic uses a 2.4 gigahertz frequency, the Spark uses both the 2.4 and the 5.8. So it would seem on the surface, if they're both broadcasting in the same frequency range, that you should be able to interchange the two. The difference is that the Mavic, on top of that ISM band, has a special proprietary technology called OcuSync, which was invented and developed by DJI, and that's what gives that Mavic a 4.3 mile distance range. That OcuSync technology will constantly be talking to the quad in a very tight relationship, and it'll look for the strongest frequency that it can broadcast on with the quad, and it does all kinds of frequency hopping as the quad is being flown, that if the channel it picked to connect sort of gets noisy, it'll move to a different channel. So that OcuSync technology riding on top of the ISM band really makes this an incredibly powerful quad. The Spark, on the other hand, uses just what I'll call naked Wi-Fi. So it's got no OcuSync or LightBridge technology built in. It's basically just broadcasting on both the 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz band and essentially it's amplifying the signal. So if you're using your cell phone or your tablet, you have a limited distance that you can broadcast a Wi-Fi signal control to drone. That's why the Spark, if you're using your phone, will only fly 100 meters or so. The minute you connect up the remote controller to your phone, this now has a lot more power, 4X more power, to transmit a lot further. And that's why if you're using the remote, you can actually fly a mile and a half. And I've flown that Spark really far away and I've been very impressed with the stability of the quad. The signal from this to the quad, rock solid signal, very, very far out, almost to the edge of my visual line of sight. So I'm very impressed with the connection topology. So these are different. Now, having said that, both of them contain the transmitters for that 2.4 gigahertz band. So it wouldn't be a stretch for me to think that DJI down the road could release a firmware update for this that would allow you to put it in, let's call it spark mode, where the OcuSync was turned off or it wasn't being used, and they were using just the standard Wi-Fi frequencies to control the spark. That would be a really nice thing for the company to do. So if you're watching this DJI, update that firmware and let us use that Mavic controller to fly our sparks. But at present, unfortunately, this is a Mavic controller, this is a spark controller, never the twain shall meet. This next question is pretty straightforward, and it has to do with how large a tablet or phone can you fit into the handles of the Spark controller. Now, I did a clip on the Mavic uh, prior that talked about the dimensions and things that would fit in there, but I thought I'd do another one because people are asking about the Spark. Now, essentially, the question I got more than others was, will an iPad Mini 4 fit in there? But I'll expand this to give you the dimensions so you know if you have a different tablet, whether it'll fit or you need to use some type of external tablet adapter. So the short answer is, in my opinion, there are two tablets, one Apple and one Android, that I use every time I fly because I find them to be incredibly reliable, and that's not an easy task. Even though there's a lot of tablets that are on the approved list, you'll find that some of those, because of the horsepower of the processor inside or because you're running a lot of other applications, will end up with kind of sketchy results. So I've settled on both the iPad Mini 4 and the Android product is the NVIDIA Shield, which I like an awful lot. It's got a fantastic video. It, it's rock solid connections through the controllers and I fly a lot of different quads. I've never had an issue with it. 
The iPad Mini 4 will slide into the bottom of that controller. The NVIDIA Shield, unfortunately, because it's a little wider, won't fit inside there. So I thought, let me show you that this fits first. So again, it's pretty straightforward. You're gonna slide it up into the two handles. And the reason it'll work is because there are slots on either side. The corners of this actually pop up through those slots and give you a really solid fit. So in essence, you're gonna slide this in like that, and that's it. It's not coming out. I mean, it's in there rock solid. So that's your, that's your iPad Mini 4. Now, the challenge is if you've got a tablet that's bigger than that, it's not going to fit in there. And you're going to have to use something like this, an external tablet adapter. So let me give you the dimensions. There's two things you have to be aware of. The first is the widest tablet you're going to be able to fit in there is about eight inches. Anything larger than that, it's going to be a bit of a wrestling match to get it in there. And you might actually crack something on these two handles. So if it's eight inches or smaller, you're probably in good shape. The other dimension you got to worry about is the grips down here. So these grips are rubber on both sides and the tablet has to, or the phone has to slide in between those two grips. Those grips will support a phone or a tablet that's thickness is between 6.5 millimeters and 8.5 millimeters. If it's bigger than that, it's gonna be really tough to get it in there. And if it's thinner than that, it may slide out. So you've gotta be really careful. Now I've heard of people actually getting in there with a Dremel and taking some of that rubber out or an X-Acto knife to fit a thicker tablet or a phone with a really thick case on it. Totally up to if you wanna do that. There is no electronics down here. So if you decide to modify that to fit your phone, you're probably gonna be okay, but just be careful when you're cutting that. But those are the dimensions for fitting it in. Now, if you've got something bigger, say you wanna use, I don't know, a 10 inch tablet or a 12 inch tablet, You've got to use something like this, which is an external tablet adapter. And these are pretty straightforward. This is just one of them I like a lot. We sell this one on the site. It basically fits in here, just like it was a phone. So it'll slide into the bottom, clips in nice and tight, and it pretends for a second, there it is, that it's a phone. Uh, or I should say that the base of this mimics a phone or a tablet. Once it's in there, you put the tablet in here, and this will extend up to 12 inches. So it'll go way up to 12 inches. And you can tighten both these two pivot points, this one and this one. And there's actually a wrench in the base of this that allows you to tighten them up. If you like it really nice and tight, you can tighten them up. It won't move an inch. You can hold this thing by it. But that'll allow you to mount something much larger on there as, as well. So if you've got a larger tablet, either wider than eight inches or thicker than the 8.5 millimeters, you're gonna have to go with something like this. And like I said, there's a wide variety of these out there on the market. The reason I like this one so much, and I've talked about it in previous clips, is that it allows me to have the tablet below, which allows me to sort of balance it on my arms like this to add the extra support of my arms to the weight of that tablet. And it works pretty well. You can also spin it above if you like. And if you spin it above, the tablet's gonna to extend up top here, which gives you a much more balanced feel when you're holding the actual uh, controller. So it's up to you which way you go. But in a nutshell, that's the answer. So you can use an iPad mini 4. It's almost like they designed this controller to be the perfect size for the iPad mini 4. It, um, it fits in there like a glove. And there are very few other tablets that I've tested, and I've tested a ton of them, that slide in as cleanly as that. So I always wonder, you know, did they design it for this specifically, or is that one that everybody uses in the design lab, and that's where they came up with the dimensions. But anyway, this will fit. Anything up to 8 inches will fit, and if it's between 6.5 and 8.5 millimeters, you're good to go. I find this next question pretty interesting, mostly because of the confusion that still exists out there in the community about the correct answer. The question is, will my DJI goggles work with my new DJI Spark? And the answer is yes, they will. Now, one of the reasons I find that interesting is the answer to that's in the manual. And I know a lot of people are saying, look man, I wanna fly, I don't wanna read. And they're not big on reading manuals. And honestly, that's not the best way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Maybe it's the geek in me, but anytime I get new tech, I gotta read the manual. And I read it cover to cover. Maybe I go back and refer to it again later. And it's mostly because I wanna understand the engineering behind a product, how the technology works. But more importantly, I want to understand all the features that are in a particular product so I can get maximum value for my dollar. So when I read through the manual and I saw the answer to that, then went on the forums and saw people still fighting back and forth. There's a huge kerfuffle going on around, I'm going to return my goggles, I'm going to return my Spark, what's going on, when's the firmware update coming? I just thought to myself, man, that's right in the manual, i got to answer this in one of the questions. So maybe part of the confusion was when the goggles first came out they were released in conjunction with the mavic which is an ocusync technology and the connection between this and the mavic is through ocusync and people were probably thinking well if it's an ocusync based system how do i connect it to a wi-fi based spark maybe there's some firmware update coming for the headset or firmware coming for the spark that'll make them compatible i, I think they were overthinking it to be honest with you the connection couldn't have been simpler you're basically going to connect a micro usb cable from the bottom of your controller to the micro USB connection on the headset. That's it. Once you connect this thing up, this takes the place of whatever tablet or phone you're using. 
And to make that connection, you're gonna use the standard cable that came with your Spark, which is a, a USB to micro USB cable. This is gonna be your friend. You use this for an awful lot on the Spark. And you make that connection to the headset. All right, and then the challenge becomes, once you make the connection to the headset, how do I connect it to my controller? So I've got it plugged into the headset. The bottom of the controller is a micro USB connection, and this is a full-size USB. I can't stick that in there, so what do I do? Well, you need one of these little adapters. This adapter turns this micro USB connection on the bottom of the controller into a female USB connection, full-size USB connection. So all you do at that point is connect these two guys up. Once that's connected, this is now tethered to your remote, and this takes the place of your phone or your tablet. Now, a word of caution, I'm not competent yet enough with the headset to make all the adjustments I have to to the menus and the submenus through the touchpad on the side. It takes a little bit of work to sort of figure that out using the back button going forward. And once you have the headset down, I'm kind of fumbling around trying to find those controls. So what I would recommend you do is before you put the headset connection into the bottom of this, make all the adjustments you're gonna make on the Spark. Make sure you've got your video lined up, you've got whatever telemetry information you need, all that stuff set up, all your sub menus dialed into exactly what you want, then make the connection as the last thing you do, put the headset on, then fly FPV. Now I've been flying with this for a couple of days in FPV mode and it works great. I've always had a spotter with me, but making that connection later rather than earlier until you get good with the headset's probably an easier thing to do. And that's really all there is to it. Now the only wild card here is that this connection here this little dongle is something that doesn't come with the Spark, so you have to buy this separately. We have them on our website, you can find them all over, but I do have just the dongle and I have the dongle and the cable if you need it. But that'll help you get this headset hooked up, and really there's nothing to it. Once you make that connection, whatever you had connected before through Wi-Fi goes blank, you lose visibility through it, the headset picks up the video and you're off and running. So it's a very simple setup, but again, it's easy to miss, and I'm hoping that by explaining it pretty clearly, uh, all the confusion out there is gonna disappear. People will just go out, Enjoy the day, fly their spark, put on their headsets and fly FPV and just have a lot of fun with the quad. This next question has to do with how long a remote will last on a full charge. Now I've been flying the spark a couple of days. My experience has been that about a two hour charge cycle will fully top this guy off. And that gives me about two, two and a half hours worth of flight time, give or take. So pretty much what you put into it is what you get out of it. And two and a half hours seems like a long time to be flying your quad. But I understand the question completely because a lot of people will bring the quad and maybe three or four extra batteries with them. They'll fly with a fresh battery. While they're flying, they'll be charging other batteries. So essentially, you can continue to fly almost indefinitely as long as your remote hangs in there. So this becomes a limiting factor on how long the fun can continue in an afternoon. So one of the tricks that I've learned, and I'll share it with you now, and I've used this on other remotes. If I turn this guy on, if you look at the remote, you've got about two bars on there, which means I've got about a half charge on it. So I could still fly about an hour, an hour, 15 minutes on that. But if I wanted to extend the day even longer, I could use an external battery pack like this. And I carry one of these with me all the time. I always charge it before I leave for the day. And if I plug in the USB cable that comes with it to the bottom of the remote, I'll show you what happens. You can probably imagine what's gonna happen here. So look at those dots now. You see how they're strobing? Essentially what you're doing is charging the remote while you're flying and you can use this to fly while you're charging it. So if I get down to one bar or two bars, I may plug in the external power supply, slip it in my front pocket, and then I can continue to fly for quite some time. One this big will actually add about four or five hours of flight time to my day. So not that I'm gonna stay out there seven or eight hours, but it's nice to know that I can fly as long as I want until the sun goes down. The other nice thing about it is if I'm between locations, like a lot of times I'll go to one location to fly and then I'll drive a half an hour or something to the next location, I can leave this plugged in and actually charge the remote while I'm driving between those locations, which is really nice. Now, it isn't the most you know clean solution having a wire dangling down there, but honestly, if I'm having a good time that day, that doesn't bother me a bit. So this power supply is a really handy thing to have. You can actually use the power supply to charge the quad as well. So if you're driving between locations, you can plug that micro USB cable right into the Spark and charge the batteries in the Spark when you're driving to your next location. So having an external power supply with you or a battery bank with you really allows you to extend the day almost indefinitely. So I guess the trick answer to this question is you're gonna get about two hours worth of use out of the standard battery. And depending on how big that power supply is, that could be 10 or 12 hours if you got a gigantic one with you. This last question has to do with the best way to charge the Spark batteries. And when it comes to charging the cells, you really have one of two options, either internal or external. Now the Spark is a unique quad in so many different ways. One of the features that I like an awful lot is it allows you to actually charge the battery in the quad itself. So if you spin the quad around, 
there's a hidden door up top here right behind the spark logo if you pop that open you're going to see a micro usb connection on one side and a micro sd card on the other side the micro sd card is obviously where your videos and photos are recorded but the usb connection is made between the spark and a power supply to actually charge the battery in the spark. It's also used for transferring those pictures and videos to your computer, but from a charging perspective, it allows you to take the standard micro USB cable that came with the spark, connect it up. Once you make the connection to the back of that, you can plug this end into any wall wart charger you've got or your computer, or even a 12 volt outlet in your car and charge the spark on the go. When that battery's full, you can pop it out, put another depleted battery in and continue to charge. So in essence, you've got a quad that has a built-in charger that allows you to charge those batteries pretty quickly. Now, to be honest, it's not the fastest way to charge your batteries, but it does get the job done. If you've got more than one battery, you might want to consider the charging hub. And if you bought the Flymore package, you actually got this hub in that Flymore package. But what the hub allows you to do is to slide in up to three batteries and you'll charge all three batteries simultaneously. So unlike the Mavic product, if you bought the Mavic hub, you would charge each battery individually till all four are charged. With this one, there's enough power in the power supply to supply current to all three of them to charge them simultaneously. So it really, really speeds up the charging cycle. There's a connection on the side that plugs into the hub and it's polarized so you can't put it in backwards. What I do find interesting though is there is no way to connect up this prong here, if you will, to the batteries. There's no way to charge these directly off that charger. So you've got to use the hub. But for me, this is a tremendous value because it allows me to put three batteries in here, charge them at the same time. And I've got two full-size USB connections over here. I can use one of these to charge my controller, the other one to charge my cell phone or my tablet, or I can connect it up to the Spark and actually charge a fourth battery at the same time. So this really speeds up the whole charging cycle. And if you're just starting out with the Spark, you might be fine with just charging it inside the quad if you're not gonna get a bunch of extra batteries. The minute you start adding a second or third battery to your kit, I think the charging hub is a good option for you. But both of these work pretty well. It's just if you charge it in the quad, it does take a little bit longer, depending on the type of charger you're using externally. That about wraps it up for the five questions for this week. Now, if I've missed something or you need more information on one of the topics I've covered, just drop your questions in the comments below and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. If you've got questions I didn't get to today and you want to send them to me, rick at dronevalley.com is the email. I'll get to them as quickly as I can in the next clip or the clip after that. Now, this is a brand new format for me and I think it works pretty well. I want to hear from you guys though. If you like this kind of format, I'll continue to do these type of clips and maybe try to do one each week to answer the top five questions that I get. The reason I wanted to do it is because I'm just getting so many questions on the Spark from people that are considering buying it, or maybe they just bought it and it's their first quad. They just got a lot of questions about how to use it, how to tune it, how to fly it, those type of things. So as long as you guys are watching them, I'll continue to do them. I really enjoy putting these clips together and I feel like I love flying so much, and I know you guys do as well. If there's anything I can do to enhance that experience for you and make it safer, I'm happy to put a clip together on that. Now, I will put links below to some of the stuff that I talked about today, that battery bank, the adapter, a couple other things that I talked about. In case you need to go out and find those, there'll be links below, which will take you to our website. And again, you can probably find them someplace else, but just to give you a starting point, we'll put a link below. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, we've noticed a lot of new subscribers joining the family, and that's a great thing. But if you haven't hit that sub button yet, please hit that today, because that really encourages me to do more of these because I see that there really are people that are invested in the channel and that drives me. That really inspires me to do more of these clips. So that's pretty much it. Thanks again for watching. I'm having a great time doing these and hopefully you're enjoying them and we'll see you soon. Happy flying.